Today we're going to take an old mini computer, my PDP-1183 running BSD Unix, and make it dance a modern dance. We're going to get out the old KNRC compiler and build some cool visual effects for the PDP-11 today, including a faithful version of the Matrix screensaver. I'll show you the whole catastrophe from end to end, from coding them up to compiling, linking and running them on the old PDP iron. All right here today, in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Sometimes, when you take on a restoration project, the ending can be strangely anticlimactic. For example, I spent about five years here in the shop restoring this 1970 GMC Sierra Grande custom camper by hand, on a rotisserie, where literally every nut and bolt was restored. And when I was done with it, it was so nice that I had so much work into it that I was scared to drive it. And with the PDP-1183, I faced any number of hurdles, from finding the right set of CPU, memory, and controller boards, to getting them all to work at once using a custom-built BSD kernel, and so on. Each step of the way is a new challenge, like trying to fit the entire Unix kernel and drivers into the available 64K of instruction space. And when I had finally jumped every hurdle and completed the race, the inevitable question then arose. Now what? Some of my non-tech friends are a little confused by my collection of old computers, particularly the bigger ones like the PDPs. You see, I pride myself that I don't have any corpses on display. Everything I have boots and works. And that makes the most frequent question, okay, but what can you do with it? And the usual answer is something like, well, you could run your payroll and accounting and maybe control your assembly line with it, but it's not doing that much here in my garage. But that's partly why I'm now running BSD Unix on it. Because even though I'm a Microsoft guy, and even though I've had Dave Cutler right here in the shop and interviewed him, I'm not running his RSX 11M very often, even though the machine will indeed boot into it. And that's because I'm primarily used to the Linux command line environment these days, and that means that a Unix environment is just going to be more familiar to me. That's even more true because my daily driver desktop, at least for productivity tasks, is a Mac Pro. And the Mac runs macOS, which has a direct link back to BSD. You see, after being unceremoniously booted out of Apple in the mid-80s, Steve Jobs then founded Next. And Next's operating system, Next Step, was built on the Mach 2.5 microkernel from Carnegie Mellon, along with substantial code from 4.3 BSD Unix. Next Step eventually evolved into OpenStep, which continued to acquire code and features from Mach and BSD. And then when Apple ultimately acquired Next in 1997, it brought Next technology in-house, which it used to build Darwin, the open-source core of macOS. 2.11 BSD was actually something of a PDP-11 side branch or fork of the 4.3 BSD code. And so, while neither descended directly from the other, macOS and 2.11 BSD do indeed share some common lineage, and the resemblance is sometimes obvious. BSD may not be macOS's father, but it's at least one of the fun uncles. In fact, to test how similar they actually are, I tried something of an experiment. I'd written a quick and dirty implementation of wget for BSD, a handy utility for just grabbing web pages off the internet. And since 2.11 BSD predates the web, it doesn't have the tool yet, so I wrote it. I kept the local copy backed up on my Mac in case something happened to the file system on the PDP, and that made me curious. Under BSD, I could just type make in that folder, and it compiles and runs it. Here I was, about 40 years of operating system evolution later, sitting at a Mac OS terminal prompt with the same files. So for the heck of it, I typed make, and about a second later, out popped my functional version of wget, complete from my original KNR-style C sources and it worked and ran with no changes. And that's where shared lineage can be handy. Let's drop into the editor and crank out a quick Hello World app on the PDP-11 just to show you how simple it is to get started. First, I'll create a temporary folder and drop into it, and then I'll edit a new file called hello.c. In that file, I'll just include the standard IO header so that we can output text, and then I'll define my main function where we actually do that by displaying a text string with the put s function call. Once my file is complete, I'll drop back out of the editor and compile it on the command line with the cc command. I'll specify hello as the name of the output program we're going to produce, and I'll give it the .c file as its input, and after compiling for a little while, out pops our hello world application. To run it, I simply type hello, but in Unix, you actually have to specify that you meant to run it from the current folder, so I have to include the path with the dot and the slash. Because unlike MS-DOS and Windows, Unix does not assume that if there's an executable in your current folder that you intended to run that one. That's to help avoid attacks made against you by compiling a Trojan binary, naming it something like ls and then putting it in your home folder, for example. 
Okay, so it's pretty easy to code up a custom little application on BSD, but what are we actually going to write? Well, there are a few things I needed to really flesh out the BSD install because as noted, it's missing things like wget and sudo and a web server and various things that I'm now used to having. So you'd think I'd start there, but no, I started with screensavers. And that's because I love the VT220 terminals that are connected to my PDP, and I always have. I even had a brand new NOS one in the box from Digital that I was saving for my wedding, but the movers lost it when I was relocating from Saskatchewan to Microsoft about 30 years ago. Along the way, I've acquired three more, though. Two ambers and a green. One is connected to the PDP1134, one is connected to the Altair, and one is connected to the PDP1183. Way back in college, I wrote my senior project on a PDP11 using a VT220 terminal. It was an assembly language version of the old arcade game Omega Race. You might remember it as being a rather simple game with an outer box, an inner box, and some enemies that float around inside the walls. Now if you know anything about serial terminals, you know that writing a game for one is not a trivial task, because everything arrives at the terminal as a simple stream of ASCII characters. You can't poke a character into memory at a particular place on the screen buffer like you can on a microcomputer. So. Doing any kind of action is challenging. What you can do is to take advantage of the VT220 control sequences. I've got this little programmer's manual for it right here, and it lists all the interesting ones, like how to move the cursor to a given XY position, or clear the screen, or scroll a region of it, and so on. Each is triggered by a special sequence that always begins with the escape code, which is ASCII 27. Then there's a square bracket, and that tells the terminal that the next bytes coming in are a special code and not regular text. The text code might be the row and column of the cursor position or a command to scroll the screen and so on. Then after the terminal processes the command, it goes back to just displaying regular text as it comes in wherever it left off. Thus, by mixing control sequences and text, you can move around the screen and draw text in arbitrary places. But we're still quite limited in how much we can do by the data rate of the terminal, which was only 2400 baud back in my projects day, but is now typically 9600. And at about 10 bits per character, that amounts to about 1k per second. If you want to draw something that's going to draw 10 times per second or anywhere close to that, that means you're going to get about 100 bytes of payload with which to do your drawing and positioning. And with that limited ability, what can we actually pull off? And it turns out you can still use it to create some interesting effects. The first one I did was the Matrix screensaver. The version you're seeing here was recorded directly off the VT220 screen. The trails you see left behind the moving letters are created by the long persistence phosphor of this monitor, and I think it's both a pleasing and a convincing effect. Now I normally connect to the PDP from a desktop session, not actually sitting at the VT220, at least when I'm coding and so on. So let's drop into Cool Retro Term, a desktop terminal for the Mac that supports some cool visualizations that will mimic the phosphor effects that we saw on the real terminal, but make it much easier to screen capture. Once logged into the PDP-11, I'll run the matrix code, and we'll see that it behaves much the same in the terminal program as it did on the real terminal. If we watch it for a while, we can see approximately how it works. Each trail is drawn at the top of the screen once per output frame, and then the entire screen is scrolled down. That means the terminal itself is actually providing most of the motion, and we're just sending a single control code per frame to do that scrolling. Now, the real VT220 supports optional smooth scrolling that the terminal program does not, but I actually keep that turned off for the matrix effect anyway to keep it more authentic to the film's original, which only scrolls by whole rows at a time. One area I had to diverge from the original is that the following characters continue to change in the original after being drawn. My first attempt was to try to do precisely that, but I found that at 9600 baud there just wasn't enough bandwidth to update all the trails, and so I had to be content with just scrolling the screen. I think the phosphor blur actually helps hide that fact to a certain extent, and it still looks pretty cool. Especially when you consider that the computer it's running on is a good 20 years older than the movie itself. Let's take a look at the main function for the matrix. We set our maximum trail length to be 8, which is the number of rows that the trails will be long. Put another way, as the screen scrolls by interminably, each trail will be drawn for 8 frames in a row. The spawn rate allows us to control how often new trails are going to be generated. The first thing our program does is what I consider an important courtesy step for the user. In the event that my program dies or is terminated, such as by pressing Ctrl C, I want to leave things in the terminal the way I found them, or at least in a usable state. Since we've moved the cursor around and we'll be turning the cursor off during drawing, we don't want to leave the user sitting without a blinking cursor and stuck in a corner of the screen. So we connect event handlers for when our program exits to a function called restore on exit. 
and restore on exit shows the cursor, resets the scrolling region, and so on, meaning the user will drop back to just a regular prompt. And that's all needed because back in main, the first thing we do is to hide the block cursor so that it doesn't fly all over the screen as we're drawing. Next, we tell the terminal that the scrolling region will be the entire screen, and then we clear the screen. Our next step is to initialize the trails, so let's have a look at that function. Each of our trails is represented by a trail object that we define, and it tracks the column of the trail, how many rows have been drawn for it so far, the ultimate length of the trail, and a flag as to whether that trail is active or not. We then have an array of trails, and the way the code is written, it's defined to have 16 of them right now. The initialize trails function just marks each of the trails as inactive to start. And so jumping back to the main loop for a minute, let's have a look at what it actually does over and over and over in the drawing loop. We can see that it periodically starts a new trail and then updates all the trails, resets the cursor, sleeps a bit, and then repeats. It's sleeping for 50 milliseconds every frame, which means that if it runs at full speed, it will be running at a maximum of 20 frames per second. But why add a delay at all if we're gated by the slow speed of the serial connection? Because I could still telnet into this machine, which is much faster than serial, and then it would probably peg the CPU and run too fast to be useful. So this clocked frame approach ensures that it runs at about the same speed under most conditions. Let's have a look at the function to start a new trail. It's going to walk through the array of trails and pick the first one it finds that is not already active. And when it does, it sets up the trail by picking a random new column number, setting the rows drawn to zero, setting the desired length, and then marking it as active. Once active, it will be drawn every frame by the update trails code. And you'll notice here that if you try to start a new trail and all 16 are already active, it just returns without an error. Each frame calls update trails to actually draw the active trails, so let's have a look at that. As you can see, it walks through the array of trails looking for any that are currently active. It then checks to see if it's reached the desired final length, and if not, it proceeds to draw it. It draws it by using an escape sequence to position the cursor at the top row of the screen in whatever column the trail data indicates. The character that's going to be drawn here is held in C, and C is set to be one of the 95 characters starting right after the exclamation mark in the ASCII table. That gives us a broad range of printable characters to pick from. Each time we draw a row, the code increments the rows drawn for that trail, so we later know when a trail has reached its end. And when the rows drawn does finally reach the desired length, you can see we mark that trail as inactive. That means it'll stop drawing, and its slot in the array will be available to be reused by the next trail that gets created. I went up writing four screensavers that day, so let's have a quick look at each. First up is this sine wave effect. The very first thing I type into most basic interpreters is a simple program that walks a sine wave like this back and forth across the screen. It does it by using the sine function multiplied by half the screen width and uses that as an offset to draw the asterisk at. The only difference here is that I'm drawing at the top of the screen and scrolling the screen down. Now my friend Glenn was rather unimpressed by it though and so I upped the ante substantially by tracking three sine waves out of phase with each other and I think it gives you a fairly interesting repeating pattern. Next up is this simple blinking star effect. As you might imagine, all it does is randomly plot a bunch of stars, then it goes back and one by one erases and randomly replaces each one in a loop. Other than needing to keep track of the list of star positions in an array, it's actually pretty simple. And finally for today is this implementation of Conway's Game of Life. That's a cellular automata game where each cell in the grid has its outcome dependent on the cells that are around it. Under varying well-defined circumstances, each cell will either be born, growing, or die, and a new frame is generated a little faster than once per second. But because of the slow frame rate that results from having to repaint the entire screen, this one isn't as compelling as it could be. I thought maybe it would be more visually interesting if I processed and drew each cellular decision independently, but I'm open to ideas. If you have a suggestion on how to make life interesting on an ASCII terminal, drop it in the comments, please. And if you've enjoyed today's little retro coding adventure, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please be sure to turn on the bell icon so that you get reminders of my very random release schedule. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. And be sure to check out our weekly podcast called Shop Talk and host it on the Dave's Attic channel. Since we're hosting it on the second channel, not that many people have seen it, but I hope you find it's worth looking for the link in the video description or just search for Dave's Attic, where you'll find the latest episodes. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.
Do it, Lynn. Do it, do it. <laughs>